Greetings to all in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, I hope that all of you had a good week. I hope that all of you experienced uh, the presence of God, the protection of God, the provisions of God, and I hope that you all uh, got to take part in the purpose of God also. And uh, we are now in the sixth part of the series, Sanctified Imaginations. For that, uh, we'll read a scripture portion. Matthew chapter 22, verse 29. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. And we'll say a word of prayer. Thank you, Father God, for bringing us once again into your presence. Thank you for your promise, Lord, that you will teach us your ways. Lord, as we are trusting you to learn your ways, to walk along your paths, to be found wholly blameless and above reproach, on the day of judgment, I pray, Lord, that your power will work in the hearts and lives of everyone who will be listening to this and to create an eternal, everlasting effect in our hearts that would be pleasing to you and would bring glory to your name. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. So the scripture portion that we read is Matthew chapter 22, 29. I'll read it once again. Jesus answered and said to them, You're mistaken, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Jesus was answering the Sadducees on their question about resurrection. As we know from the scriptures, the Sadducees did not uh, believe in resurrection. They had come up with an argument uh, which they thought was brilliant against resurrection. The fact that we have an argument against something does not mean that uh, what we say is right. So Jesus was answering them. He was saying, you are mistaken because you don't know the scriptures, nor the power of God. So it is very important to know the scriptures or the word of God and the power of God if we are to walk in harmony with God uh, on earth. It is very important to have peace, to have a purpose in our life, uh, to have uh, enjoyment, uh, to have everything that life offers in our life uh, that we walk with the one who created this universe and the one who runs this universe. We can be mistaken on anything, but if we are mistaken about God, the entire purpose of life becomes uh, distorted. So that's what Jesus is saying here to the Sadducees. They are experts. They are religious experts. Uh, we could uh, call them theological scholars, but the thing is that they truly did not know the scriptures. They did not know the power of God, and they ended up arguing against uh, the truth of God. So it is very important for us to know uh, the power of God on earth. There are three levels on which we can know the power of God. Uh, one is uh, at the, the level of uh, an intelligence in our brain, just a piece of information in our brain. The second is uh, you can know the power of God as a truth that guides your heart. And the third is you can know the power of God as an experience in your life or you can experience the power of God in our life. So generally speaking, the power of God is manifest in two ways and uh, we can see both of them mentioned in the epistle of Paul to uh, the Romans and it's in chapter 1. I'll read those verses, Romans uh, chapter 1 verse 20 to 23. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and the birds and the four-footed animals and creeping things. So here, the power of God is manifest to all humanity in everything that he made or in everything that he created. Here, the apostle goes on to say that the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen and the invisible attributes that he mentions are the eternal power of God. The eternal power of God 
and the divine nature of God is manifest in his creation. And from these verses, we understand that God expects every human being to discern to a certain extent his divine attributes through all that he has created. We can uh, look at everything that's created around us and we can have a mental picture of God's power that created everything. When we look at the book of Genesis, we see that God spoke everything into being. He just said those verses only once. He's not repeating those verses again and again. For example, he said, let there be light. He's not saying, let there be light every morning. He just said it once. So the word had, that he spoke at that time is still alive and is still doing the work over and over again, continuously, repeatedly, creatively, not only about light, we see God spoke everything into being, the animals, the birds, the fishes, uh, the, all the plant, the vegetation on earth, everything. That was just one word that he spoke and that word is still alive and active and creative and doing uh, whatever it was intended to do every single day in every part of the world all throughout the universe. So the power of God is uh, manifested through the spoken word. And in Hebrews chapter 11 was uh, chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, we see that Jesus upholds everything by the power of his word. That's who being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. So the word of God uses these two things, the word of God and the power of God interchangeably. There is no power of God without the word of God and there is no word of God without the power of God. Wherever the word of God is received with a childlike faith, the power of God is at work to fulfill that particular word. And whenever we expect the power of God to come upon us, the first thing we need to do is open our hearts to the word of God. And in Romans chapter 1, the verses that we read, we see that because they did not discern the attributes of God that was evident through creation, they ended up becoming fools and they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the image of corruptible man in birds and four-footed animals. That's what happens when we will not open our hearts to receive what little revelation is available through us, to us through the natural. And the second level of the power of God or uh, the, the second area where the power of God is manifest is not manifest to everyone. It is manifest to a particular group of people. And we see that in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 to 17, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So here, this power of God is available to everyone who believes. So the criteria here is faith, faith in the word of God faith in the gospel. So the power of God is manifest through creation to everyone while the power of God unto salvation or the power of God that is available for the salvation of mankind is uh, evident or it can be experienced only by those who believe. And what does this power of God do? We read that in verse 17, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. So, the power of God works in the heart, in the life of a person who believes in the gospel to reveal the righteousness of God, to reveal the righteousness of God practically. So, we are depending on the power of God to have God's righteousness revealed in our hearts and in our life. And then it's written, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So here the word of God says that those who are acknowledged as just or righteous by God are the ones who believe the word of God, who believe the scriptures and because of that have the power of God at work in them to lead them along 
the paths of righteousness. It just takes childlike faith because God is the author and the finisher of our righteousness. Jesus is called the author of eternal salvation. So from these two verses we see that salvation and righteousness are two sides of the same coin. You cannot have salvation without righteousness and uh, we cannot have righteousness without salvation. If you are saved, you have righteousness because you are trusting on the power of God to uh, produce or to reveal the righteousness of God in us. So, these are the two ways that the power of God is manifest on earth. So we have been thinking about sanctified imaginations. For, so whenever we come across the standards of God uh, as um, uh, relating to righteousness, we should have a mental picture of the power of God working in us to take us out of everything that is not righteous and to establish us and to help us grow in the righteousness of God. We need to have that, uh, that assurance in our hearts that what we cannot do can be accomplished if we lean, if we lean heavily on the power of God. So, uh, Paul talks about this power many times uh, in, in his epistles and uh, we can see the nature of this power. He, he wants the, the church in Ephesus to know the nature of God's power. As I said earlier, there are uh, three levels on which we can know every truth in the Bible. The first is that's a piece of uh, information in our brain. The second, it's a truth that guides your heart. And the third one is it's an experience that no one can deny, not even we can deny. So uh, we'll go to that scripture portion, Ephesians chapter 1, verses uh, 15 onwards. So therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened, being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. So in this prayer, Paul prays that the eyes of the heart of the church in Ephesus be enlightened, that they may receive the spirit of uh, wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God to know three things. And the first one is the hope to which they are called, two, the riches of the glory of the inheritance of Christ in the saints. And the third one is the exceeding greatness of his power. And again, he's bringing up the, the issue of faith for towards those who believe. The power of God is available for everyone for sustenance of physical life on earth. But the power of God is available to those who believe in the gospel to save them to produce his righteousness in them. And so here Paul is saying that the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. And then he goes on to describe the nature of this power or what this power accomplished in the past that we see here which he worked in Christ. So the power of God that is available for those who believe is the same power that worked in Christ when he was in the tomb and raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So the power of God that worked in Christ to raise him from the dead and seat, he, seated him uh, in the heavenly places at the right hand side of the Father is the same power that is working for those who believe. So we all know that it was the sin, the collective sin of all mankind that took Jesus to where he was in the tomb. The Father put all our sins upon Jesus and Jesus paid the price or the penalty for our sins and as a result he was dead and he was in the tomb. So the collective sin of all mankind had exhibited its effect in the death of Christ. He is dead. He is in the tomb. 
and then the power of God comes upon him, raises him from the dead and seats him in the heavenly places at the right hand side of the Father. The same power is available for us. So none of us are carrying the collective sin of all mankind. All of us are carrying our own sins or uh, until we are saved. So no matter how strong the power of sin is in our life, the same power can work in us to bring us out from that bondage of sin and to take us to a place of fellow. What does it mean uh, to be in the heavenly places? It means that we have fellowship with God. And uh, as we had discussed earlier, fellowship with God means that we know each other's heart and there is perfect agreement. So the power of God can work in us no matter how much deep or uh, how much uh, uh, long standing these sinful habits have been. If you keep on trusting in God, if you keep on waiting on God for his power to work in us, if you keep on uh, renewing your faith in the gospel, the power of God can work in us and br bring us out from the bondage of sin and bring us to a place of perfect fellowship with God and with Jesus Christ. And that's why we see in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 4, it's written, uh, But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, which means when we are in living in our sin, we cannot have fellowship with God. There is no agreement with God. There is no knowing each other's heart. We are living in darkness. We don't know what God is doing. We don't know what he's going to do in the future. We're living in darkness and that is called dead in trespasses. He made us alive together with Christ and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This means that although we are physically present on earth, our hearts are with God. We know the heart of God more than we know the heart of anyone in our life. And uh, God knows our heart more than anyone else knowing our heart. There is this perfect relationship that is growing in fellowship. We grow in our knowledge of God. And the more we know God, the more we'll be able to trust Him. And that's what it's written here, that we are seated. He made us to sit. It's not that we went and sat with uh, Jesus in heavenly places. He says that God in His mercy, we need to see it. We need to be able to imagine or have a mental picture of the power of God at work to accomplish all of this in our lives and then the attributes mentioned in this verses four onwards is rich in mercy not only his power uh, at work for us his mercy and not only little mercy he is not stingy when it comes to mercy it's written he is rich in mercy so we are depending on the power of God we are depending on the riches of God's mercy and then it's written because of his great love with which he loved us. So the gospel is not about us trying to live up to the standards of God. It's about us trusting and resting in the power of God. It is about us having confidence in the riches of his mercy, having confidence in his great love that he will not give up on us. He will keep on working in us. He will take us out of whatever holds us down and he will lift us up to a place of perfect fellowship with him. There is a concept of growth here. There is a concept of discipline where uh, we may have to be disciplined to let go of some of our thought patterns or behavior patterns. But all of that is done in love. So it is absolutely necessary for us to know the power of God. We can see uh, Paul say talk about this in Philippians uh, chapter 3 verses 7 onwards where he says, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my, nor, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness, which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death. So knowing Christ is important and knowing his power is part of knowing Christ. So what we understand from today's uh, session is that if we allow God to open our hearts, 
give us his spirit, we will be able to know the power of God not only as a piece of information. This has been recorded by Paul who experienced the power of God in his life as to salvation and he saw the power of God at work in his life to save others also. So, it is my prayer and it is my desire that the Lord will help us all to know his power on a supernatural level beyond our understanding. He'll open our eyes to know his power that we may not be mistaken like the Sadhugis. And with that, uh, we'll close uh, with a word of prayer. Thank you, Father God for the time you helped us to spend in your presence. Thank you for uh, introducing to us, Lord, the topic of your power. I pray that you will uh, cause many to know your power, to experience your power, and that they will experience the salvation, the joy of salvation in their lives through the word that has been ministered here, Lord. Lord, I pray for all those uh, who have been following and uh, who you have predestined to be blessed through this series, that Lord, all of us will be driven by your power and by your love to accomplish your purposes on earth and that we will be found wholly blameless and above reproach on the day of judgment. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen.